Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another Ask the Experts workshop presented by Children and Screens. I am Pamela Hurst Della Pietra, the organization's president and founder, and I'm your host today. For those of you who have joined us for the first time, Children and Screens is one of the nation's leading nonprofits that advances and supports inter interdisciplinary scientific research into the cognitive, psychosocial, emotional, behavioral, and physical effects of digital media on toddlers, children, and adolescents. We bring together clinicians, researchers, public health experts, educators, authors, and the public to explore what the science says about these topics. During the pandemic, in addition to our workshop series, Children and Screens is providing research funding for studies that investigate the impacts of technology use during this time period and beyond. Both the wonderful ways screens are helping us to connect and how the increase in screen usage may be negatively impacting children and teens development. This summer, teens are experiencing a norm new normal. 24-7 screen time, quarantine protocols, canceled activities, remote internships, virtual graduations, a social justice movement resulting uh, with uh, really a lot of exposure to violence on the news, and uh, more have left many teens, uh, teens and their parents unsure of what to do next. Indeed, what does a summer at home uh, leave uh, many teens? Is it okay that uh, my teens are spending hours uh, every day playing video games online uh, with their classmates, um, texting at the same time and on Snapchat? Is all this news okay for my teen to watch? Uh, we know that you have many questions about your kids and screens and we're here to help. We hope that the discussion uh, today about managing your summer on and off screen will help facilitate conversations with your teens and other family members, and that our answers to your questions will help you manage this unusual time. I'd like to extend a big thank you in advance to our outstanding panel of experts for being with us today. Our panelists have reviewed the questions you submitted and will answer as many as they can. If you have additional questions during the workshop, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll answer as many as time permits. We are recording today's workshop and hope to upload it to a video uh, on, you sorry, upload it on YouTube in the coming days. Uh, you'll receive a link to our YouTube channel tomorrow uh, where you'll find videos from our past webinars. Um, it is now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Bob Builder. Uh, Dr. Builder is the director of the Tenenbaum Center for the Biology of Creativity and a distinguished professor of psychiatry and psychology at UCLA and has more than 30 years experience in research on brain behavior relations with experience in clinical clinical neuropsychology, neurophysiology, structural and functional neuroimaging and genomic strategies as well as um, these are applied to the study of both healthy people and those with various neurological and psychiatric syndromes. We are delighted to have Dr. Builder with us today to uh, share his experience. Welcome. Thank you so much, Pamela. This is a, a great honor. Thank you so much for including me and uh, what an amazing panel that you've assembled to address the topics uh, that couldn't be more timely today. Um, you know, I think as we've uh, <laughs> encountered multiple challenges going from acute stress to chronic stress uh, and, and uh, fresh stress, um, uh, we really need uh, to hear from the experts that, that uh, you've lined up today. And I'm looking forward to a really exciting panel. Um, uh, I'm, I'm worried about being a moderator because moderation has never been my strong suit, but that's okay. Uh, we'll do our best. And I'm, I'm uh, very excited to at least listen um, and learn and uh, be able to ask questions uh, that are coming from you in the audience uh, from our distinguished panel. So first up, um, we have an, the amazing Paul Weigel. He's an MD, is a child and adolescent psychiatrist at Notchog Hospital, Hartford Healthcare, uh, and he's chair of their media committee, uh, of the media committee at the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Um, he's written and taught extensively about adolescents' media use, including uh, papers about tech addiction, social media interactions, and the impacts on teens' mental health, and, and much, much more. So um, 
let's get on to it. Um, Paul, take it away, please. Thank you, Bob. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you today. Uh, as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, I am um, consistently you know, working with these issues to help improve the health of my patients and also the teenagers that I have at home as well. Um, so my plan for the next 10 minutes is to talk a little bit about the developmental and health needs of adolescents. Uh, talk a little bit about screen time, what has become the new normal, how, um, uh, what, a, what a healthy balance looks like, and how parents can help their kids to achieve it. Um, so uh, when we're thinking about the needs of adolescents, of course, uh, the first uh, need that comes to mind is physical needs, uh, the need for adequate sleep, uh, for, um, for a healthy diet, and for physical movement and exercise. But of course, there are psychological needs as well. And uh, adolescents are, are at, the, at this um, critical juncture where they need us parents to provide structure for them. They desperately need structure in their lives in order to be healthy. But at the same time, they also require autonomy. They really need to be allowed to you know, make some of their own decisions. And even when uh, those decisions, uh, you know, might not always turn out positive. And so finding this balance between these two is the challenge of parenting an adolescent, one of many, I suppose. Um, adolescents also need opportunities for mastery. This is mastery over uh, the skills they're gonna need to uh, have productive lives as adults. And, uh, and, and there are many of those. Um, adolescents also, this is the time in their life where they are trying on different identities to see what fits. And they need opportunities to practice that. And that often comes socially. And some of that they can get via uh, social media. Others really um, is, uh, is uh, others they, they really need to experience sort of in person. And of course, that's a bigger challenge than ever in our current situation. Finally, adolescents need their family. They won't admit it oftentimes, and, um, and sometimes they do their best to subvert it. But my clinical experience and studies show when adolescents become withdrawn from their families, um, really their, their, their health declines significantly, uh, their mental health especially. So, so uh, something important to remember that, that, that they do need us. They're not adults yet. So, um, so what has become the norm with screen habits uh, for young people in America? Well, uh, the best study that, uh, that I know of is the Kaiser Family Foundation study, which was taken over by the Common Sense Media uh, Survey, which every five years surveys young people on their screen habits. And amazingly, when we look at the difference between teens in 2000 and teens in 2019, we found that the average amount of screen exposure has practically doubled. And the biggest increases, of course, are in the internet and video games. So on your average day, a teenager has exposure of seven hours and 22 minutes of screen entertainment, not including schoolwork or, um, or anything like that. Now, this, uh, this number is a little bit inflated because at times, screens are, uh, times teens are exposed to multiple screens at once, and those could get counted as double. But really, um, screen media has come to really dominate the free time of young people and uh, who are spending more time engaged in screen media than they are going to school, even when they were going to school. Um, so what has, what has this uh, change happens as adolescents is being moved really on, onto screens to a large degree? Well, one really wonderful positive change is that adolescents are engaging in much less risky behaviors. Um, so teen pregnancy has plummeted, violent crime among teens has dropped significantly, um, alcohol, cigarette, drug use, and uh, fatalities, uh, teen fatalities and car accidents all declined. Um, because uh, teens are engaging in these activities, these risky activities, less. Mm -hmm. However, we're also seeing significant declines in healthy behaviors among teens. Um, so uh, socializing with friends, learning how to drive, uh, reading for pleasure, uh, books that is, of course, or magazines, and getting sufficient sleep. Um, the last graph here shows the number, percentage of teens who get less than seven hours of sleep and most need more than nine. Um, and we can see that that has really increased in recent years with the rise of screen media. And the obesity rate among teens in America has continued to climb 30% higher since the year 2000. So uh, in many ways, it appears that uh, the, the, uh, the 
the amount of screen habits that young people are engaging in are getting in the way of these things, the healthy sleep, healthy diet, exercise, socially, um, uh, social get-togethers, and so forth. At the same time, we have seen significant um, increases and very concerning increases and rates of depression and anxiety among uh, young people. And the suicide uh, rate among teens has uh, grown significantly in, uh, in recent years. And the data on this is mixed, but, but it does appear that those who are online the most, those who are on screen the most, uh, do appear to be at the greatest risk. Um, so what about COVID? Now, under COVID, and uh, this was an um, article from the New York Times uh, that I wanted to share, coronavirus ended the screen time debate, screens won. And it really made a significant difference in, all, in, in the lives of so many young people. One survey of 3,000 parents, uh, they indicated that screen time among their kids had roughly doubled uh, since uh, COVID began. And um, looking forward, without the responsibilities of, of distance learning, screen time is only likely to increase for many uh, uh, youth. So what can we do about this as parents? What should we do? Well, so of course, we're all familiar with the, uh, the food pyramid. And um, this is sort of an activity pyramid of healthy habits for, uh, for young people. And it is really important to be mindful that, um, that young people have a sufficient time um, in their day that they're devoting to these activities, uh, physical activity, of course, meals and self-care are so important, uh, time for uh, time spent with the family, socializing in person when possible and safe, um, doing activities with academic value, which of course reading, or, or other mastery skills such as chores, which teach responsibility. Um, and and the, you notice that the biggest area at the bottom of the pyramid is sleep. And sleep is so important for the physical and mental health for young people. It really is the foundation of health for a lot of our teens in a way that is not always easy to tell. Um, but sufficient sleep is protective against depression, against anxiety, against obesity, junk food diet, um, and is uh, essential for learning. Um, so oftentimes that, if there's one one thing to focus on, sleep is often the most important. So when we're thinking about guiding um, teens uh, towards healthy uh, habits, we need to remember that teens do, uh, their, their circadian rhythms, their sleep-wake cycles are different than those of adults. They have a longer um, circadian rhythm, a 25-hour, which essentially is like kind of being on jet lag every day, um, which this is why it's harder for teens to get to sleep. But it's also why it's even more important uh, for teens that they sleep at a regular time. Because left to their own devices, uh, literally or figuratively, teens are very often uh, inclined to stay up later and later until they're really sleeping during the day and up at night. And when this happens, which I often see with my patients, um, this is detrimental to all of the other health behaviors that, that I mentioned. They're not eating healthy meals typically, they're not getting exercise at night or doing chores or, or doing healthier activities. So oftentimes the most important thing I can do is to help regulate sleep. Now, sunlight and ambient light and being awake is really what resets the adolescent's clock. So that's why it's really important for teens to have light exposure and be out of bed in the morning preferably at eight o'clock uh, in the morning is sort of ideal, um, although far from what many teens would like to do. And sometimes, and, it, and screen media has only exacerbated the issue because young people are um, engaged and excited. And, and it is, of course, important for uh, as much as we can for parents to be role models. That means putting away the phones at dinner ourselves and maybe considering following some of the same rules, having our phones charged downstairs at night, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, also, of course, anything we can do to help promote healthy activities really decreases the need to, to monitor screen time. And, and I believe Richard and uh, Delaney will talk about that more. Of course, going outside is super important, but obviously something like this uh, doesn't count. 
when we're uh, talking about uh, when we're talking with kids about um, the uh, about screen habits, it's important to remember that younger kids really need us to impose the limits for them. But as teens get older, um, they really need to as as much as they can be granted more autonomy over their own decisions. And so it's ideal for parents to serve more as a guide and less as a police officer, uh, to especially to older teens. And and that um, that can be helped by by playing video games, watching TV shows with our kids. And sometimes that means watching shows or playing games we'd rather not. Um, but that can really help to open a dialogue. And that's what we want, is an open dialogue with kids um, about screen habits and choices so that the, we can encourage critical decision making. And when, now this is easier said than done, of course, um, but it's so important to remember that when having these discussions with teens, important to be curious, to, to, to be interested in their perspective and to validate their perspective and to avoid being judgmental as much as possible. Um, so uh, some resources for parents that I wanted to mention. Uh, I, I really like the book Raising a Screen a Smart Child by Juliana Minor. Um, and I think that the built-in parental controls on Windows 10, on iPhones, on Xbox or PlayStation can be very, very helpful in taking away some of the, uh, the, the conflict. However, of course, kids sem can sometimes get around these uh, controls. So these are more of a complement for supervision than they are a um, replacement for them. Finally, I, I do want to mention that that as parents, we don't need to be perfect. Um, you know, kids are very resilient, and uh, and certainly we don't always need to get it right. But but if you're concerned that that you really are unable to help your teen or to control their unhealthy uh, media habits, or if you're concerned that if you tried, they might try to hurt themselves or to hurt you, um, that is a red flag that, that this is a teen who really needs help. And, uh, and if that happens, it's really important to seek out help from a qualified mental health professional because treatment works. Uh, that's uh, time to power off for me, but, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. That was really terrific. And uh, yeah, I, I'm sure the audience is, is going to be getting a lot out of that. Um, thanks for not only telling us so much uh, powerful information, but also providing us with a lot of, you know, really valuable tips. And for the audience, I want you to know that on the um, uh, Children's Screens website, on the Institute of Digital Media and Child Development website, there's lots more tips um, that, that you'll have um, that, that you should check out. Um, let me try to get one question in for Paul. Uh, and um, uh, I, I loved your um, uh, a pyramid showing about the allocation of time um, and how important that kind of structure is uh, for our teens um, in, in helping to guide their sleep and other activities um, and, and trying to um, help them find the right activities and structure. But uh, I think that finding the balance between being a guide versus being a cop is mm -hmm. challenging. And I wonder how you recommend um, parents uh, pursue that that delicate balance. Yeah, so um, certainly whenever possible, you know, it, it is better to guide kids to make their own uh, decisions. And and unfortunately, this does really depend a lot on the maturity and, and the issues that the teen have, uh, the teen is having. Unfortunately, those who have sort of an addictive habit and really um, are, uh, they can't regulate their own screen use and have the most problems uh, because of extra excessive screen habits are often uh, the ones who need those firm limits uh, the most. And this can make for some significant conflict sometimes. Um, and this is where, again, you know, uh, pulling in the help of a, a mental health professional can be uh, valuable. But I believe that uh, Delaney will be talking more about some of the, some of the ways to uh, maintain an open dialogue uh, about about, uh, about, um, about screen media habits. So I'm going to hold off. Uh, for her. That's great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, and yeah, we have two fantastic speakers there. I mean, I'm very excited to hear from, uh, from Delaney Russell. I'm going to introduce her in a second. I want to make sure everybody knows, though, that we also have Richard Louvre um, coming up next. So don't tune out um, when Delaney is done. Um, make sure you stick around uh, for, for Richard's exciting presentation. Um, but, uh, but first, let's hear from Delaney. Delaney uh, Rustin is also a physician and director and producer of Screenagers and Screenagers Next Chapter, uh, award-winning documentaries for social change. Uh, Dr. Rustin has been a researcher and physician at major medical schools and has spent years providing primary care to the underserved. Um, 
Dr. Rustin, take it away. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here because this is so hard parenting in this tech revolution and I'm there with you. Nine years ago, I was struggling so much. I was an emotional wreck. I would get so mad at my kids as they begged for more screen time and they toggled back and forth and they were sneaking it. And then I'd get mad and then I would feel guilty that I got mad. And I kept doing this thing called the grab and stab where I would just grab whatever device was in their hand and just stab them with my eyes. And that was not working. It was just making the stress more. And so as a mom, I really needed help, like what to do. And as a physician, I wanted to understand the impact of the screen time. So I decided I was going to make this documentary. I didn't have, uh, actually at the time it was called uh, Out of Control. It became Screen Eaters, but in my head, I just felt like it was out of control. And I said, this is going to be easy. There's lots of families who are struggling. So this won't be a problem because I had been working for years doing uh, documentaries on mental health issues. And that can be really hard to get people to come forward. And yet when I went to parents and said, hey, can I film what's going on? They said, no, absolutely not. And it was a big revelation to me to realize how private parenting is. Not only as a culture do we think of it as a unique on its own unit, but also it's the most important thing we do. And so of course we're gonna feel judged and yet we're in this tech revolution. So I realized this tech revolution really warrants a parenting revolution where parents are actively coming out and sharing with each other what they've tried, what works, what doesn't work where they're finding the courage to be vulnerable and saying to other parents, um, you know, can we do a tech free carpool or can we work together and have Fortnite go off at a certain time or when you come over, can we all put the phones away? And that it needs as parents for us to be in schools and other places advocating for change for tech balance. And I think that the greatest ammunition that we have for a revolution is that of the love of our kids. And it's powerful. You know, I think about our host today, um, Dr. Pamela Hurst de la Pietra, and she and I were talking years ago when she was starting Children and Screens. And yes, she wanted to start this as a doctor, but most importantly, she told me it was her as a mother, her love for her kids and all kids, that she wanted to see things better. And she wanted to and started to do it to bring all the researchers together in this field and to figure out what the main needs were and to get funding to them for research, which the government and other people were not doing. This is one parent who is not, does not sleep much to do what she has been doing. It's pretty amazing. What I hope from all of you today is that you don't feel like you have to start a big organization, but if you take home one message from me, it will be that I hope that something that you learn today as we move through this webinar, if there's anything that you try and it works or that you learn from, to tell five other parents about it. That's going to make a big difference. And, you know, my work and passion has been all about how do we get kids and adults from all, to, all backgrounds together to talk about solutions and particularly using communication science. That's what I did after my residency. I was researching communication science. And now it's that lens on what's more effective, what's less effective. I really have moved for several years now researching this for teens. I wanna give a few uh, ideas now and then more will come up in the uh, Q&A and to actually show a clip from the film Screenagers Next Chapter, which just came out recently that looks at skills for parents and for kids and teens around stress, anxiety, emotion, and screen time issues. So let me start with the, what I call the three Ps, people, positive, and um, policies. So people. It's really so effective is that when we share with our teens stories of other people 
when it comes to things like sexting or screen time use, et cetera. And that's why I purposely made uh, these documentaries that have stories of other people so that kids and teens see the stories and then, then it's a launching point for conversations. Or for example, I've started for four and a half years a blog that's weekly, Tech Talk Tuesday, which is all about getting parents and kids to have conversations. But you don't have to see the documentaries or this. There's plenty of vignettes on Children and Screens website and others, but it's very effective. And the second P is um, that of positive. I was surprised how negative I was being around screen time. I would do this scare tactic, like you think things are gonna disappear on Snapchat, they're not going to. And then my kids didn't wanna negotiate like screen time limits. And it was funny because as a doctor, I know scare tactics don't work, uh, but I kept trying. And I realized that in society also we're using this scare tactic, you know, saying that screens are ruining the generation and all of this. So all of this were making them defensive. So I needed to become positive. And so when we do our weekly talk about screen time in our lives, Tech Talk Tuesdays, we always start with something positive about technology, and there are so many, and that just brings their defensiveness way down and we can have better conversations. Um, families that I work with where they're having World War III in their home because of screen time issues, which right now with COVID, lots of parents are telling me how they don't like how they're the energy in the home is with all the screen time. What I often recommend is a three day tech love fest that you as the parent get to spend three days talking about all the amazing things about technology. All the things that we, that we're the last generation that couldn't look up, what you can do with leftover coffee and have 10 ideas right there or else anything, right? I mean, we are the last generation to know this incredible difference. And I could talk for days and days about the positivity. When families do this, they say, Delaney, it really resets things. And then the third P is about policies and programs. And it's parents stepping forward to get involved in schools or after school programs and being advocates for our kids. So one of the programs um, we started was something called Away for the Day. And it's all sorts of resources on the awayfortheday.org website where parents have taken these to schools and like middle schools in particular and literally changed the policy so that phones are away for the day so that kids, particularly those who find it adversive to have to do social contact, that they start to um, do that more because they can't turn into their screens. I often think about Bill Gates and how he talks about how socially awkward he felt, particularly in middle school, and how he'd go to the library and became friends with a librarian who helped become a mentor to him. And he often talks about her in, in the work that he does. And we want to engage that. But there's something else too that I feel deeply about in terms of programs. And that's the one I wanna share right now from Screenagers Next Chapter. I think if I had a magic wand, first and foremost, I would have older teens teaching younger teens about technology and social media and communication. And I had the privilege of filming one such program in Massachusetts. And the video then continues just for a moment into uh, a little sound, a part about how important it is to be face to face with their friends. It's just a minute and a half. It might very well lag a little bit because of Zoom, but um, if you do want to see Screenagers or Screenagers Next Chapter with your teen, <laughs> um, those can be found at Screenagers Movie website and people can now see them online. And we're doing it through communities with discussions. And um, right now we're gonna go ahead and queue up the clip. Our generation, we mainly grew up with phones and we had the face-to-face -face communication. So I've had this situation where I went up to somebody and apologized, but I really had no idea how to approach it because I always use a phone to apologize. I know I had that happen like 
probably like three days ago. <laughs> when I was driving to my friend's house and we had to have a conversation and I was so nervous. It's one of my best friends and it was so hard for to like sit there and her say like I felt this way about something I did and then have myself like not jump in and say well that's that's not right. So like I had to sit there and think about what she was feeling and not just defend myself the first chance I got. That it made you feel that way. I remember Vanessa talking about when she had the situation with her friend and that was a better way of communicating because if not, like how I would usually do it, barging into a conversation, we really never get the point across and it just comes into me defending myself. Not just reacting, but instead using skills, it's hard work, but it clearly fosters better relationships. And the data shows that spending more time in person with others is strongly correlated with greater happiness. Particularly for teenagers, we know that experiences with their peers are among the most important experiences that they have. If my teenagers were to play video games alone in their room all day, um, rather than spend time with their friends, that would concern me. It's really fantastic. Really fantastic. I, I, I delighted to see Delaney, uh, my buddy Danny Pine, showing up there in that last clip. That's really beautiful. Really beautiful. Uh, thank you so much. That was an incredible presentation. And uh, yeah, I think that screening screenagers with one's own team sounds like a great, uh, a great activity. But I was wondering, you know, you're highlighting how to turn the conversation positive um, and focus on the positives of technology. I wondered if you could share with us, um, you know, a couple of the ideas, whether it's um, focusing on particular platforms that help to um, provide a more authentic experience. I remember being very troubled when Mark Zuckerberg said that Facebook was the way to develop an authentic personal identity. And I felt that I wasn't sure that was true, but it, I, I would like to hear from you. What do you think are the things that teens can do to uh, be positive in their interactions? Oh gosh, I mean, Oh, that they can use positive in their interactions. Well, I just, yeah. you know, we talk about the positives in general, a new app I just used yesterday, how to get my, for transcripts onto something, or, you know, they will talk about um, how they are enjoying TikTok and then how they get rid of it because it's taking up too much time. Um, but, you know, we first talk about, well, why? Because it is super engaging to see people doing funny things and how that works in the brain. But there's, um, it's really just that celebration of all the, um, you know, TED Talks that we can show our kids to give them the things that we worry. We worry they're losing perspective, other people's perspectives. Um, and so we talk about great TED Talks that, we will, that we'll watch together. I mean, the, the positive things on screen time provides is endless. And I, I'll add that we know that only 3% of the time that kids and teens are on screens is content creation. So I do, they know that I love that when we talk about um, something fun like using uh, Premiere Pro to edit a video, for example, is something they know I really uh, appreciate is how do we use technology to foster creativity and have time off of screens to foster creativity as well. That's beautiful. And, and thanks for the shout out to creativity. I'll come back to that in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, but, but meanwhile, uh, please do remember that uh, uh, advice and tips like this and more is available by the Children and Screens uh, website. Um, but let's, let's move along because we have a fantastic presentation coming up from Richard Liu. Um, uh, for those who don't know Richard, uh, he's a journalist and author of 10 books, including Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. He's also written The Nature Principle, and vitamin N. His new book is Our Wild Calling, How Connecting with Animals Can Transform Our Lives and Save Theirs. In addition, Richard is the co-founder and chair emeritus of the nonprofit Children and Nature Network, which supports a new nature movement. It's really fantastic. Richard, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. It's, it's really great to be on a panel with such distinguished uh, panelists and speakers. Um, First, I, I want to say the the uh, the emphasis on being positive and, and not totally negative about 
technology is really important. Uh, uh, there's a, a bumper sticker slogan in one of my books, uh, The Nature Principle, which is the more high tech our lives become, the more nature we need. It's an equation. It's a, it's a question of, uh, of budgeting, budgeting of money, budgeting of time. It applies to families, it applies to schools. Uh, and the research suggests that when we burn out, whether it's our teenagers or ourselves, when we burn out from too much screen time, the best way to uh, regenerate our, our, our brain is to go outside in nature. And it doesn't take a lot. So these two things work together, the technology and nature. We need both. And our lives are going to become more technological. We certainly uh, discovered that in the, in the last few weeks. Uh, uh, Zoom now dominates our lives, so many of this. That's not going to go away. So we may have to make a conscious effort to balance that neurologically uh, with, uh, uh, with experiences, direct experiences in nature, as direct as we can get them. Um, COVID has actually raised the value of nature, even though we're spending more and more time on, uh, on screens. Uh, COVID has actually increased uh, the, the, the value that play, people place on nature. You don't know what you, you have until you, it's gone. And now all of, all of the uh, hunger to go to the park, to go outside, to find some nature, we've seen that again and again in the parks until the parks are overcrowded and they've had to pull back on that. Th that's evidence, I think, of a deep hunger that people have naturally for, for nature. Uh, the, the most recent book that I wrote is called Our Wild Calling, and it is about uh, our relationship with other animals, whether it's uh, companion animals or wild animals. And one of the themes of it is human loneliness and isolation. There is an epidemic of loneliness going on uh, that medical folks uh, uh, sometimes call an epidemic. Uh, they're finding that some of the diseases associated with human isolation uh, are now worse because of loneliness than they are because of obesity uh, uh, or uh, other uh, causes of early morbidity. This is, as this has been uh, recognized, tech gets blamed a lot for that, and certainly there's a lot of blame to go around. Uh, I make the case in our wild calling that there's something else going on, that this loneliness that we and our teenagers and our kids feel so deeply uh, is, is rooted in a much deeper loneliness, which is species loneliness. As a species, we're desperate not to feel alone in the universe. Why else would we look for Bigfoot? Why else would we look for life on other planets when it may not be good to find intelligent life on other planets? Uh, it's because we're desperate to feel, uh, not to feel alone in the universe. The urban parks that have the best impact on human psychological health happen to be the ones uh, that are the uh, uh, ones with the greatest biodiversity. Uh, so this species loneliness, we need to take care of that, particularly as we have withdrawn more into the indoors. As I say, nature has become uh, seen in greater value by people nearby nature in particular, the nature outside your, your door. If you're lucky enough to have a, a yard, the nature in your yard, uh, the nature in a window box, the, the raptor building a nest on the ledge across the street in an urban neighborhood, all of those things now are taking on greater value. Um, when I wrote Last Child in the Woods, the first of these four books about what I called nature deficit disorder, I could find about 60 rigorous studies about the impact of nature, both of the, the deficit of nature in people's lives, but also the positive benefits. I could only find about 60 rigorous studies that I thought were good enough to quote. And that was in 2005. Uh, I thought that was astounding, astounding that something so large as the impact of nature on human development had been virtually ignored by the academic world. Uh, I have some good news, which is uh, the Children in Nature Network, which was a nonprofit that grew out of Last Child in the Woods, has a research library. First, we worked with folks at Yale and now with the University of Minnesota 
We've got an online research library that anybody in the world can go to for free and learn mainly about the benefits of nature for teenagers, for children, and for adults. It's gone from about 60 studies to over 1,000 studies. And they all point in the same direction, uh, which is that this may be fundamental to human development, may be fundamental to uh, raising uh, healthy kids and raising ourselves throughout our lives to have that association with nature. Some people uh, attribute this to what E.O. Wilson calls the biophilia hypothesis, which holds that we are hardwired genetically to have an affiliation with the rest of nature. We need it. And when we don't get enough of it, we don't do so well. So the recent studies, many of these 1,000 studies have shown over 50 of them have pointed to nature playing, playing in nature as a key role in development of pro-environmental behavior, uh, particularly uh, by fostering an emotional connection to nature. Uh, healthy urban ecosystems can lead to more cohesive neighborhoods, reduced aggression, lower crime, reduced attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder in children and adults, and other mental and physical health indicators. Experience in the natural world may serve as a buffer to depression and anxiety. It's particularly important right now. Uh, it can help to reduce obesity and myopia. It can boost the immune system, again, particularly important right now. It can improve social bonding, reduce social violence, even uh, within the home. Uh, it may even help raise standardized test scores and graduation rates. There's some real interesting studies about schools that have greened themselves. I don't mean social uh, solar panels. I mean, they actually have school gardens and, and they go on field trips, that forgotten thing that schools don't do much of anymore uh, to nature. The, uh, test scores, standardized test scores are higher in those schools and these aren't self-selected kids. They've, uh, they've factored in socioeconomic background in those studies. Um, as a result, gardens and, and natural schoolyards are far more common in schools today than they were just a couple of years ago. Nature preschools are booming. Uh, as of 2017, they've increased about 500% just in eight years, and they've increased possibly as much of, as that just in the last few years since 2017. Um, they're seen as more and more important because in the age of the coronavirus, social distancing is easier outside in a natural or learning area. Um, even so, um, I had a lunch that was requested with a professor who was one of the lead people on what was, is being billed as the largest study ever done on teenagers, on what affects their outcome as adults. Not sure why I was asked to go to this lunch, because when I asked about what they're looking into in terms of how nature experience affects uh, uh, teenagers and their development, they didn't have one question on the survey yet. I hope they have since then put something on there. But this is still a hard sell to people to, sh to say that uh, nature experience is really fundamental to our health and our children's health and, and our teenagers' health. Um, the, um, uh, one of the ways, I think, to uh, deal with this, rather than saying no to everything, is to suggest that, that you know, there are superpowers involved with uh, connection to nature. I talk about the hybrid mind. Um, the best way to explain the hybrid mind is, I met a guy who, tell, who teaches people how to become uh, pilots of cruise ships. And um, he said he gets two kinds of students. One kind of student uh, grew up mainly inside on couches playing video games and all that. He said, they have talents I need. They're really good at electronics. Got a lot of electronics on my ships. The other kind of student uh, grew up mainly outside or a lot of time spent outside, whether they were in rural areas or parents went camping a lot, whatever it is. He said, that kind of student also has a talent that I need that kind of student can actually tell where the ship is because their spatial senses have been developed while the spatial senses of the kids, of the, of the young adults who grew up mainly on screens uh, had atrophied. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of research that will support this. 
the people who study uh, the human senses no longer talk about five senses. They talk conservatively about nine or 10 human senses, and they all have names. Some of the people who study human senses talk about as many as 30 human senses. We have some of the ability of bats to use echolocation to get ourselves around. In the dark, we have um, much better noses than we think. We can track through the woods just with our noses, um, a, a trail, a scent trail. Uh, we have these abilities that we tend not to use. The more time we spend on screens, the more we try to block out as many of those, as many as 30 or more senses as we can. That to me is the very definition of being less alive. I don't know any parent that wants their child to be less alive or their teenager. But when we talk about these as superpowers of developing a hybrid mind that balances the technological mind with the natural mind, that's a more powerful mind. I think the future is gonna to belong to people with hybrid minds. I think that's a good argument to use with teenagers. These are superpowers that have been neglected. Um, in any case, I think I'm running out of time here and, and we'll probably want to go to the, to the next section or the questions. Thank you so Didn't much. Get that, yeah. that was really, really, truly inspiring. And uh, yeah, I, I'm really um, stunned thinking about how we can enable our superpowers to not be blocked, how we can promote them um, uh, through nature. And, and indeed, there are some questions that have come in from the audience um, that have focused on what's being done in curricula nowadays to try to uh, develop these superpowers. Are there nature-oriented uh, curricula that are really, um, you know, addressing this imperative to, um, you know, for physical and mental health to be involved in nature, to connect to animals, et cetera. I well, there are, as I curricula. said, uh, natural school uh, yards uh, are really booming in schools. It's kind of a, a, a counter movement to the, I think, over emphasis on tech on computers and iPads in schools. And again, I'm not high tech. The more high tech we need, the more nature we need. Um, uh, out, much of this is being done outside of school, in after school programs, in summer programs, in camps, and, and all of that. But increasingly, teachers are, are focused on this. One of the studies shows that the teachers who get to take their students outside in nature, they don't burn out as early as teachers who are locked into that cubicle with them. And again, the emphasis in, in recent years has been on you know, no child left behind. And there's a lot of good things that came from that. But over testing, spending more and more hours in the school, they're canceling recess. This is not a good idea. There's a lot of research that shows that recess raises test scores. And yet we cancel that along with uh, 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 art and music. Nature is in there in terms of raising test scores. Um, some of the things that are being done outside of school and I, I should say something here about what parents can do right now um, first off um, even using technology is, is possible possibly right now particularly because of people being locked inside you know people can use digital ca cameras even in their yard and bring back in great pictures of nature and share them uh, you can be a sound catcher you can use your cell phones to record nature sounds you can do a noise study of your neighborhood if you can get out into your neighborhood. Uh, a lot of these ideas are in vitamin N, which is 500 things that people can do. Um, you can be an electronic wildlife watcher. You can go on to Cornell University's uh, bird watch. You can actually you know, participate as a citizen scientist in that. Um, uh, also, um, uh, in terms of pure nature, you can, uh, you can find a sit spot in your yard and just wait for nature to show up. You can do that in, in uh, schoolyards also. This is being used where you're quiet. You're not doing science experiments. You're waiting for nature to come back because you've disturbed it. And when it comes back, it's an amazing experience. You can create a neighborhood wild watch, even, even on Facebook. You can do this with your neighbors, the retirees that live at the corner, your parents. You can watch the animals that are actually coming into the cities. They were coming into the cities before COVID, wild animals. 
you can watch them, observe them, report them to each other. You can actually learn to love them um, by doing this and sharing that information. There's one, and in Our Rock Calling, I, I, I write about a guy, a, a program that teaches bird language, teaches people, takes hundreds of people out into the woods, including teenagers who I interviewed some of them, who learn bird language, not so much how to talk to them, but to actually know what the birds are saying. And that's, that's fascinating. And then finally, I, I think it's important. Um, as I said, this last book is about our relationship with animals, and that means pets too. Pets are extraordinarily important now for stress reduction, for that sense of loneliness, but so are the wild animals right outside our window, even though we don't know very much about how they affect us. And there's not that much research about how they affect um, our mental health and, and so forth. One of the suggestions I make is that parents, families sit around the kitchen table or in the living room and tell animal stories. You know, the parents can tell the, about that animal they ran into in the woods that changed their lives, that something happened between them and that co coyote, you know, and that, or that fox that they've remembered their whole lives. Kids have stories, too, of these encounters that they don't tell very often because they get embarrassed. Many of the people who told me stories for Wild Calling uh, had never told those stories before. But the more they told the stories, the more meaning they found in them and they were excited about them. And I, I think that that opens doors into different ways of knowing the world, which is really what all of this is about. That's fantastic, really beautiful. And um, yeah, we're gonna return to some of that in a couple of minutes um, because we wanna have an open conversation and Q&A with everybody. Um, uh, as a segue to that though, um, uh, uh, Pamela has invited me to share with you all a little bit of the uh, a few ideas that we have from our studies of creativity uh, at UCLA, and we'll see if I can uh, uh, connect this to um, what we've been talking about. Um, and uh, uh, one thing that occurred to me while Richard was talking is that my own connection with animals has been enhanced uh, by the pandemic, and that there are some advantages to masking. This is me and my my dog Maverick um, bonding with each other. And um, the interesting thing though, is that it also connects to the idea of loneliness and that when I share this with a couple of my colleagues via the Zoom meetings that we are having constantly, I got back a couple of other pictures from my friends. Oh, I've got a German Shepherd too. Um, and uh, so you got some really good looking dogs out there and one that is even extremely talented at playing billiards. So you never know what's gonna happen um, and uh, just made me, uh, it, it triggered me to <laughs> hear Richard talk about how our connections to animals can really uh, make a difference to us. And, um, you know, and, and talking about connections, I think that some of our work on creativity um, has focused on how are the different parts of the brain and how are the networks that exist in our brains oriented to promote creativity and how does this possibly connect back to um, screens and, and teams. And um, uh, in order to persuade you, I need to show you colorful images of the brain because we know that evidence that is accompanied by colorful pictures of the brain is much more credible and believable than the same information if it is not accompanied by colorful pictures of the brain. So anyhow, I wanted to show you these colorful pictures of the brain. This is actually a, extracted from the entire world literature, looking at 10 million articles about the brain intersecting with the term creativity and the regions of the brain, putting it onto a probabilistic atlas of the brain without ever studying a single person. It's just from the literature, anyhow. Um, but what I think gives us a better idea of networks is something we already know about, like how do airplanes navigate the world? And this is one of the ways that we actually look at brain networks, is try to look at them in a sort of a graphical model, what's connected to what? And as you know from your own experience flying, you can't fly from any airport to any other airport. Instead, there are major hub airports and that those hub airports are connected to other hub airports. And if you wanna to get to someplace local, usually you go to a big hub airport and then get out to another airport. And so this is a much more efficient way to get from one place to the other. And so we've used these same techniques to try to study the brain and you would think that in order to be more creative, you want the best brain possible, why wouldn't you want to have the most efficient brain possible, right? Well, turns out 
It's just the opposite. What we find is in studying groups of people who are exceptionally creative, exceptional visual artists, exceptional scientists, all compared to people who are very smart, but not exceptionally creative. We see that the pattern of small world or more efficient network connections is not the one that's deployed by people who have big C creative brains. Instead, they have a more random pattern of connections in their brains. And so you may be wondering, where the heck is this going? But uh, what I believe connects this to the work that we've just been, in, been thinking about is that the way that digital media and our interactions with screens has developed, it is pushing information to us in a way that is dominating us and constraining our senses in a way that is exactly what Richard was talking about in pruning some of those sensory superpowers. Um, it's inhibiting our abilities to do the balance and complementary task of driving the world ourselves, of creating things spontaneously, engaging productively and proactively in interacting with our environment, and instead being the recipients so that the responsive mode needs to be counteracted by a projectional and, and, and forward thinking mode. And I think that's what um, our creative people do in forging these random connections in their brains is that they're doing what they want to do. They're not doing what is suggested to them by their devices. And that brings to mind um, one of the key dialectics. We teach a course uh, at UCLA in personal brain management. Think about what you can do with your brain now that you're learning enough about brain mechanisms to do something with it. And uh, Ray Kurzweil has, has written uh, futuristic works talking about the singularity when non-biological intelligence exceeds biological intelligence. There are superpowers out in the knowledge that's being aggregated throughout the world, throughout the internet, throughout the, con the connected devices that we have in the world. Um, at the same time, that's perhaps robbing us of some of the uniquely human capacities. And I think the counterpoint to the work of Ray Kurzweil is that of a guy like Ron Lanier, who focuses on how what we're seeing in the development of the internet and the development of this technology um, is really a, a race to abstract things and narrow things further, when instead what we really want to be do, doing is, is developing and putting out there our own selves um, into the world rather than letting the world uh, speak to us. So what, what Lanier recommends is making sure that the experience is ultimately up to you, not the tools. That's what I loved about Delaney's talking about how positive we can see technology, but we have to realize that we're the ones who are driving the technology. We should never let the technology drive us. Um, and it, it, just to, to connect it back to mental health, some of the work that's been done um, in trying to understand um, our attentional systems and how that relates to depression and anxiety comes from meditation practices. You know, you could divide up the different kinds of contemplative practices into those that focus on broadening our attention versus those that are narrowing our attention. Well, it turns out that if you look at folks who are more anxious, they have a more narrowed attention. And those who have successfully fought anxiety uh, have a more broadened and open attention. And it also turns out that if you engage in contemplative practices that enable you to broaden your attention, that that is an anxiolytic that helps to cure anxiety disorders. So I think that while much of our technology has been drilling down our attentional field, narrowing our attentional field, and I think as we engage in these Zoom meetings, we're focusing on trying to interact with other people who are only one inch square for hours on end. This is narrowing our attention. And I think that the efforts to get out in nature, to broaden your attention, to drive your own activity, these are some of the keys that, um, uh, that in my view, connect the ability to manage the technology effectively, get out of the screens, manage the screens ourselves, that that will promote a more creative, diverse uh, outcome for all of our teams. Um, and uh, I, I went to the, do the most rigorous scientific study and just asked my own kids who are now teenagers, just graduated from high school in the class of 2020. But I asked them what was most important to them um, in promoting creativity. And uh, uh, central to that was freedom, um, that um, they be unconstrained. And so I think, again, as we liberate our children from the confines of screens, 
help them to manage screens, manage technology, and engage with the real world, which has a lot bigger bandwidth than do any of their other devices. I think that is, is one of the keys to um, promoting a more creative future. So with that, I'd like to thank all my colleagues, and people that have paid for us to do these fancy research and create colorful brain images. Anyhow, so thank you so much. Let's move on um, into a more general uh, Q&A. Um, I know we've got a million questions um, from, um, from the audience. Um, and um, I think uh, uh, one of the first questions I'd like to focus on is um, yeah uh, that go play outside image that that you showed earlier, <laughs> Paul. Um, yeah, how can a team motivate themselves, or how can we help to motivate them to get to doing something um, when um, you know they're feeling down, bored, anxious? I mean, I've gone out. I, I embarrass my teenagers. Sometimes uh, we go on vacations together and I'll see two kids next to each other on a bench with their devices playing games, but they're right next to each other. And I'll actually go up to these other kids and say, hey, you know, there's actually a three dimensional human being right next to you. And the bandwidth of that human that you could interact with is much higher than what you can get through your phone. But what, what do you do? So I, I do think that something we tend to uh, undervalue is the um, is the, the gift of of, of boredom. I think having some time and being able to sort of um, uh, manage that is is very, very valuable. But a lot of teens, um, you know, these days, especially the ones who engage in the most, you know, immediate gratification screen media really struggle with this. And sometimes I, I think that it's important to have a little bit of that um, in order for creativity to, to happen, in order for ideas uh, to happen. Um, of course, um, so when we're, we're thinking about encouraging our kids to do things um, that don't involve screens, one of the, the biggest draws that sometimes that we can, uh, uh, we can, we can uh, offer is connections with other teens. And of course, we do need to be careful about this in the time of COVID, but, um, you know, uh, going on, on, on uh, having outdoor get-togethers uh, with, uh, with friends, um, whether it be going on a, on a hike with, uh, with another family or cousins or going uh, to do a, you know, an outdoor bonfire or something like that, like that with friends, that can be a huge draw. Um, and so that's uh, something to think about. And of course, in my day, you know, uh, teens would, would, almost, would always make these connections themselves. But a lot of teens that, that I see, they really need help in doing this. And sometimes when, par when parents uh, help to arrange that, kids really take advantage and benefit. That's, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. Um, Delaney, what do you think? Um, what we're really, uh, this focus on how do we motivate our teens and then um, help to um, offer them positive yeah. ways to yeah. engage with the world. Well, I love, Paul, what you are saying about, um, it's not helicopter parenting when sometimes we make these plans and use other families, for example, and say, you know what, these are our good friends, let's all go for a hike, and the teen might roll their eyes. Uh, but you also let the teen pick other things. But I think that that's that fine line. Of course, we're not hyper managing, but we do need to be engaged in that. That um, is tricky, but important because of the draw that free time becomes screen time. And I think that I had to learn the hard way that I was always problem solving for my daughter, particularly because she went through really depression symptoms for quite a while. And, and you see that story in Screenagers Next Chapter. But I wanted to run in and just say, oh, why don't you go outside, go for a jog, you'll feel better. And it just made things worse. And so I had to look at the science. And I, and I found a, a, a wonderful scientist who had literally um, put monitors on parents and teens, had the teens doing an unsolvable prob, uh, puzzle on the computer. They didn't know it was unsolvable. And then the parents were told not to help the teen with the puzzle. And they were measuring their, each of their stress levels. And invariably, most all of the parents eventually came in to try to help. And they could see that the stress level of the parents went down and that of the teens went up. 
when we go in and try to control, we increase our stress. And that's why it's like nails on the chalk chalkboard. So what I started to do instead was to say, first and foremost, you know, what solutions are you having, you know, that the recommendations are an hour of physical activity a day? You know, what, what are you thinking? So I'm letting them know that I trust their problem solving skills. And the second I say is, you know what, if you feel stuck, I'm here. Let me know if you want help in brainstorming. So that those tricks have really helped. It's really nice. There's a great modeling of kind of openness um, in parenting and the importance of listening um, uh, as opposed to advising, uh, <laughs> contributing our, our, our great and unmatched wisdom. Um, there was another thing that just struck me, Richard, um, you know, as we're seeing educational institutions of all kinds trying to figure out what to do in the fall um, in the world of COVID mitigation. How, how many of them are looking to outdoor engaged programs as part of the part of the solution? If you can't be in the classroom, why not have classes that are out in the world? Anyhow, I wonder what I'm sure you've thought more about this than I have. I've thought about the need to do that, and there's lots of things that can be done. I think it's a little early to know what's being done, though. Uh, I hope somebody's asking that really good question. Uh, how are the schools using the outdoors right now? And th then you also have to define what outdoors means, what nature means. I mean, it's a lot different in an inner city neighborhood than it is in a, in a suburban or rural neighborhood, but that doesn't mean that nature isn't around. I mean, birds, for instance, are in inner cities, and uh, it's even more important uh, in uh, densely populated neighbor neighborhoods for kids to have this experience. So I hope they are looking into that. One thing I was thinking about in terms of the helicopter parenting or helicopter teaching um, uh, that Delaney talked about, uh, I learned from one uh, mother, she calls what she does hummingbird parenting. And she's a hummingbird parent, which means that she doesn't hover right over her kids. She stays at a, as far away as she can, but with visual distance. We, I remember we used to, my wife and I used to do that from our kitchen window. We had a you know, a canyon behind our house, the kids, but we'd, we'd watch. Um, and a hummingbird parent doesn't hover right over them. A hummingbird parent stays back and then swoops in only when the kid is in mortal danger. And uh, with teenagers, that's kind of enforced. It, it just happens. It, it's not our choice at that point so much, but you can still be a hummingbird parent. I think we have to uh, also uh, not underestimate the teenagers or the child's ability to choose nature. I visited um, a summer program at uh, the Mohonk Preserve in New Paltz, New York. And the kids there, I was told, the kids there were given a choice for when they were going to do, uh, they were going to go out and explore and record their nature experiences. They were given a choice between using traditional media, pads of paper, pencils, you know, old fashioned compasses and so forth, or high-tech tools to explore and record. And overwhelmingly, they chose paper and pencils and the, the old-fashioned media. The kids did. Um, and I think there's something going on, even though so much of this is on their back now with so much technology. I think people our age, we're a little too enthralled with technology. I'm not sure kids are as enthralled with it. Now they do it all the time, often because they're not given an alternative. But I remember my, um, my grandmother walking with, holding her hand in Independence, Missouri, walking along. She would stop every three feet, it seemed, and point up into the air and say, look, Richie, there's an aeroplane, an aeroplane. Every plane that went over, it got really old. And um, she was still in awe of that technology because she was born in, 1880s, I think. She was still in awe of that. We are still in awe. We're kind of fearful of technology, people who are older. Kids, they're not fearful of it. So the novel thing now is nature. The novel thing now may be a paper and pencil, uh, a paper, pencil, and paper, maybe um, uh, using old fashioned media. Now, I'm not sure that's true. I hope somebody's really studying that, but I've seen that in, in kids. Uh, 
when given a choice, uh, they may well choose things that we don't think they're going to choose. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Um, you know, I want to make sure that we all have time to talk about what's going on today. We've never been in a time like the one we're currently experiencing. I think that with the global pandemic going back to mid-March, all of our kids have been taken out of their schools pretty much, separated from their friends. They're missing critical social experiences from that, along with the fears of illness. Um, that's been going on now for months. That's past the point at which we usually in medicine and psychiatry refer to things as being acute stress disorders are now chronic stress disorders. And then within the last couple of weeks, uh, the exposure of these horrific crimes and the kinds of social injustices that have been with us for hundreds, if not thousands of years being exposed and, and laid bare. So that's what's on the media right now. And I wonder if, if each of you be willing to talk for a few minutes about what kind of advice you can share with us parents um, about the best ways to help to manage those stresses, the kinds of anxiety that are really unique, um, mounting on top of other anxieties that are really unique. I, I would love to step in for a moment and just to say that, you know, as I, made the film Screen Eater's Next Chapter that, that looks at stress, anxiety, and depression. And one of the many stories is with my daughter who is having ongoing depression. And when I had the rough cut of the film, I really wanted to see, does she really want to be in it, right? I mean, here I am, the mom making the film. I said, Tessa, there's plenty of stories and science. You don't need to be in it. And um, she said, well, yeah, of course, I'll watch the rough cut, mom. And you know, I'll think deeply about it. And she watched and she came to me with tears and she said, mom, when I watch other people's stories, it's helping me so much. I want to help others. I definitely want to be in it. And since then, she's gone on the road and she does Q&As with me. And one of the problems that we know, I, I see a lot of in my practice as a physician um, teens, is that they, unfortunately, depression and stress and these emotions tell their brain, don't tell other people. You know, don't tell others that you're having this depression. You're, this is bad. And I do a lot of prevention with young people. I say, this is what's going to happen. If you start having depression, it's going to tell you that you're different, you're wrong, don't tell other people, you don't deserve help, you're a burden. I inoculate them with all of this. The key thing is that helping others is the best antidepressant we have. And also when youth are able to talk about their hard emotions and particularly to talk to others, it gives purpose to their pain and it does help others to come open about what's going on. So while this is really hard right now that we are seeing this intensity of the civil rights movement and all that's happening, it is giving many teens a sense of purpose. Of course, unfortunately they have intense black and white thinking so they're going to a very much of an extreme. And so as a parent, I just wrote a blog last week about this. I have one coming out tomorrow, but so much of it is validating, 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 seeing it from their perspective. And um, before, you know, not, we don't have to agree with it. We don't have to condone it. We don't want to change their emotion. We're just seeing it from their perspective. And then from there with time, we'll be able to help them see a broader perspective. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I, oh, I agree. yeah, thank you. I, I, I absolutely agree with that when, when, um, that, uh, it's so important to maintain this open dialogue for us to understand what's going on with our kids. And, and the biggest mistake that I certainly have made many times and, and many parents mistake is to kind of rush to a conclusion, to tell them what the real answer is. And that is something that is ingrained in us and we've been doing it since they were little. Uh, however, um, it's so important to be able to sort of, you know, listen and, uh, and understand where they're at and made them feel, you know, uh, validated and to kind of 
we'll keep our judgment um, uh, to ourselves. And and the other thing that 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 um, that uh, Dr. Russell brought up that I think was fantastic is is uh, advocacy is taking some of that anxiety and figuring out what can we do with it for teens who are you know anxious about COVID. You know could you know could giving back in a way like giving blood or or or, or something like that. Could that be a way that they could kind of give back and get a little bit of mastery of the situation? For those who are concerned about the events that are going on in the world, perhaps, you know, um, participating in a safe way in advocacy, you know, may be a way that they can um, uh, do that. I, I do think that another important point for discussions that's relevant here is that sometimes it's really important to be able to have the right setting for discussions. And when teens are sort of when they're looking at their phones, when they're distracted, a lot of times it, if starting the discussion there, it's not gonna work. So creating these situations like the dinner table, like other times that are sort of screen free, maybe driving in a car are, are really, really valuable. And, and you have to put up with a little bit of withdrawal in the beginning, but, but with your patient and, and allow that's when you know, the connections happen. It's wonderful, wonderful. And Richard, I don't know if you have to you know, thoughts you wanted to share about how uh, uh, um, the natural honest, world. I, I, and being I, I love the, uh, what, what you all have, have said um, and turning that into something positive. And I think we have to acknowledge that this is true of adults too. I find I'm pretty cranky lately. You know, this is this, the effects are true of us. And if we're honest about that, that helps. Um, I, I've given a lot of thought to the trauma that this is causing, and the, we know from the research that that an association with nature, whether again, whether it's our pets with other than human life, uh, or wild, wildlife, or even plants around us, has a calming and stress reducing effect on all of us, including teens. But I think at this point, we need to turn that into action and not only consume nature in a way that reduces stress for our teenagers and us, but to actually nurture it, to give reciprocity. You know, for everything that nature gives us, we need to give more back. Uh, for instance, not only learning about our yard and the plants in it as a school assignment over Zoom, but maybe planting native plants in our yard to help bring back butterfly migration routes and bird migration routes to begin become nurturing to nature. Um, I've talked in the past a lot in the prior books about what I call the, uh, uh, the dystopian trance that I think we've been in for a long time, even before the current unpleasantness in which uh, I've wondered, what is it we see? What images do we see in our head of what the far future looks like? And I've become convinced over time that at least in our culture, most of those images that come up right away in people's minds look a lot like Blade Runner or Mad Max or Best of Hunger Games, at least there's a few trees. You know, it's a post-apocalyptic future, but we're kind of living in that a little bit right now. What happens to a culture that only has images of a post-apocalyptic future in its head? Martin Luther King said and demonstrated in many ways that any movement, any culture will fail if it cannot imagine, cannot paint a picture of a world, a future that people will want to go to. His speech was not called, I have a nightmare. To the extent that we can, with our teenagers, intergenerationally begin to see a future that is different, that is a place that is filled with nature, it is filled with human connection, that is filled with love for each other and for nature, and that we receive from nature. What would that look like? What would cities look like if they could become engines of biodiversity, not the enemy? You know, what would our workplaces, what would our schools, what would the home we're in right now look like if it was as immersed in nature every day as it is in technology? And then get up tomorrow morning and start making that world. The same is true for the pandemic, this one and the ones that are coming. We've got all the data we need. 
What we lack, I think, is the emotion that comes with that. And that's one of the thing that's, things that's increasingly missing in education. It's increasingly missing in environmentalism. Um, the successful social movements that have moved people from data to action have been the ones about relationship. To the extent that we can move ourselves from data to relationship to talking about, in fact, love, uh, we will have a much better chance of escaping this deep uh, dystopian trance we're in. And finally, I was asked to go to speak in Newtown three months after Sandy Hook happened, the, the killing of the kids in the school. And I was puzzled why I would be asked to to speak. I spoke at a nature center and I spoke at the little town hall, New England town hall there. And I asked them, why, why do you want me to do this? And they said, because we know that nature is healing. We also, and I said, why three months later? And they said, because the psychological folks, the psychologists, et cetera, told us that there's a kind of a secondary trauma that happens often three months later after an event like this. And it's a survivor's trauma. I think we're going to have a real trauma after this supposedly ends. As we re-enter society, as we go back to the cubicles that we work in, as kids go back to the schools, we have to be prepared for that. And we're going to need nature more than, than we even need it now. That's fantastic. Well, you know, I'm really grateful to you all for your recommendations. It's, it strikes me how you've all talked about the importance of connections as we go forward, connections to the natural world, connections to each other, and also the importance of finding meaning and purpose that drives our actions, um, that that may be part of the key to navigating a future of our teams and screens. And uh, you know, I think the kinds of advice that you all have provided, um, that uh, it gives me hope that we'll be moving forward into a, a, a utopian future, not a dystopian one, and one that's, that's filled with love. But speaking of love, let me reintroduce Pamela first de la Pietra, uh, who can help us close out the session. Thank you so much, uh, Bob, Richard, Paul, and Delaney for a tremendous workshop with so much to think about and so many great ideas uh, to support families and teens. And thank you to our audience uh, for coming and for asking the panel such insightful questions. Uh, the conversation will continue throughout the summer with weekly workshops about uh, children, uh, screens, uh, and uh, human development uh, starting on June 17th. Please keep your eye uh, uh, to our website, which is childrenandscreens.com for more information. Please share the YouTube video you'll receive of today's workshop with your fellow parents, teachers, clinicians, researchers, and friends. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. When you leave the workshop, you'll see a link to a short survey. Please click on the link and let us know what you thought of the workshop. Thanks again, and everyone, be safe and well. <laughs>